Well, thank you very much for that. I feel tired listening to that myself. But it's funny what you can stack up over 52 years. Um, I think what I'm really wanting to sort of try and talk about a bit here is assets, not money. I was listening to the colleague there from the States. And I mean, obviously, money, bank, liquidity, cash, whatever you want to talk about is very important. But, you know, there are assets in this community that money can't buy, like land. You can't buy land in this society. You'd need a hell of a lot of money. In fact, you'd need more than money. You'd need to be part of the aristocracy. Uh, there's assets you can't touch. You know, the assets of our coast, of our foreshore, of our sea, of our rivers. You can't touch that with money. You can't buy access to rivers that are time shared out of existence. You can't buy being able to use the asset of the sea when it's run and owned effectively and managed by the Crown Estates Commission, run by a bunch of estate agents from London. So, you know, there's other questions to ask because the question that suggests that money is the source of everything is both true and false and materialist at its core. And really what I'm trying to say is if we just started again to look at what would any bunch of people need to be able to sustain themselves, then the first thing you need, forget the money, it's just a glorified form of barter. The first thing you need is access to your natural assets. And that's the thing which, which um, has all my life has struck me and which I've been involved in. Egg is one example. Um, just so I'm not sort of preaching to the converted, how many people know about the story of egg here? Right, and uh, the rest of you not too sure? Um, well, I suppose there's also folk, <laughs> folk watching. Um, egg is a little Hebridean island about 11 miles west of Malig and it was inconsequential, um, I guess, until uh, the early 1990s. It had a series of landowners. The most recent then was a guy called Keith Schellenberg, uh, a very extraordinary guy, not dissimilar to Donald Trump, actually, but then when you've listened to Donald Trump all morning, everybody who seems to be a bit of an arrogant sod reminds you of Donald Trump. Anyway, Keith Schellenberg, he was apparently a, 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 an Olympic bobsleigh champion, um, and he bought egg. Uh, with that, he had that kind of Laird's appreciation. In fact, again, so similar to Donald Trump. I've just heard Donald Trump talking about our coastline, meaning, you know, the Trump Organization's coastline when he's talking about the many estate. Um, all the way through this, the presumption that buying land effectively means that you own everything to do with it is not a part of Scots law. You know, Scots law fundamentally looks at land as something where you might be the custodian. You're a custodian for the next generation. The idea of ownership came very late. So anyway, um, Keith Schellenberg bought egg and thought he was the king of the castle and acted like it. Um, things kind of quiet, were quietly difficult on the island, like they're quietly difficult in lots of basically feudal communities around Scotland, where if you ask anyone if something's, you know, if there's problems, they won't voice up because people are too scared to do that. So everyone goes, well, you know, we've got bigger fish to fry, you haven't got problems, that's magic, let's go off and worry about something else. No. So on egg, things came to a head with the explosion of Keith Schellenberg's Rolls Royce. Now, I'm not saying what happened, <laughs> safe to say that on the event of my wedding, I was presented with a piece of the camshaft, <laughs> um, which sits on the mantelpiece. Anyway, so that did bring things to a head. Schellenberg had been uh, moving around on the Rolls Royce at the same time as about a third of the people on the island had no security of tenure had no leases from him, which meant they couldn't apply for housing improvement grants, which meant old ladies were living in one room with cold water and bricks to hold down the skylights. So um, that was kind of, you know, just lorable life on egg. Equally, uh, people were using diesel generators, which is the most expensive and polluting form of, of energy to use uh, because nothing better could be put in. When I went over there, just sort of for the crack in 1991, I think. Maggie Fife, who many of you will now be able to visualize, long hair, laughing lady from Hull. Um, anyway, Maggie, I couldn't persuade Maggie Fife to pick up the phone 
and complained to Highland Council about the lack of a refuse collection. Now, if any of you have seen Maggie in action lately, you'll know she's changed. That lady shifts around million, millions of quid now between accounts. They're running electricity, which is a completely integrated form of renewable energy. They've won so many blinking awards, I can't keep up with them. And the biggest award they've won is that the population is increasing with the youngsters of egg. Because, and this is me finally getting to the point, after the community buyout there, which took a long, long time and happened in 1997, I think it's uh, 15 years this year, is it? 15? Anyway. Um, after that, one of the first things they did was give land to young people who wanted to build a house. Duh. It just immediately takes 50 to 60,000 quid out of the budget for building a house. And uh, on the island, there's all sorts of kind of wacky houses being experimented with. Somebody's done a straw bale house. You'd hasten to add the straw bales are not on the outside, but they're being used as insulation. Many of you who've ever built anything will know there's many different ways to build something. The classic way we do it is expensive, stone-based, doesn't necessarily need to be the way. Now everybody's known that for a million years. Very few people have had the chance to put it into practice. Go to egg, they're doing it. Uh, another thing they did, they changed the allocations policy. The first couple of houses that were fixed by the egg building cooperative, which was set up by the hitherto unemployed and arguably sometimes unemployable men there, um, who got their act together big time and formed a building cooperative. Uh, the first houses that were refurbished had a number of people applying to get them. And there was the young guy of the island who uh, was running sheep. Um, there were two lassies separately who were friends. Uh, and there was an old lady from the mainland who'd been born on egg and would have that sort of veteran's claim on a house. Um, against all the way that councils would allocate housing, or all the way that housing associations would allocate it, they gave the house to the two girls. Because, there's two of them for starters, because the old lady would have made that a second home, and because the young guy would stay anyway, and it's women that are the first to leave. Women depopulate rural areas fastest. Young women leave, and that takes so much away from a community. So, of course, needless to say, the two gals were something of a honeypot, Without going into more detail, they're both mothers now. Um, they have, <laughs> you know, they have added to the population of eggs, shall we say? And you know, stabilising the women stabilises the island. Smart move, smart move. Broke the rules. So you know, when you start now, when I go to egg, people, same people that couldn't lift the phone to complain about no refuse collection, are sort of going, "Do you think we could actually do tidal energy there? And then, do you think if we actually use the hydro, we could use the hydro? You know, we could sort of pump stuff up using the kind of intermittent energy from the tidal, uh, and then we could take the hydro down when we want it." And I mean, it's astonishing. You know, it's that kind of practical experience and confidence that comes from being able to touch. Nature. And as someone who is now doing a PhD in Norway, which is where I have to go to next because I have Norwegian classes which are somewhat integral to any hope of getting this blasted PhD done. Anyway, um, you know, now to me, the heartbreaking thing is seeing what might have been. As long as you, if you're Scots, as long as this is what you know, you're fine. When you see something that works the way this place could have worked, you're not fine. And when you start to see you know, the ease with which lots of ideas in Norway can be done, because people haven't got this you know, looking over their shoulder feeling when they're outdoors, they don't even understand what you mean when you say that you can't go fishing. Their idea of hunting, and I know this is debatable you know, for a lot of people, is not a bunch of toffs running around with plus fours coming out of helicopters at you. In fact, I didn't even bother saying that's what happens here. It was too embarrassing. You know, in Finland, I spoke to some farmers there when we were cycling around. These guys, uh, when they do the hunt, they cull elk according to what the local uh, com committee decides, how many need to go. Uh, they then all have the day, the kids get the day off school. Uh, lots of the women are better marksmen than the men. So the women tend to do a lot of the hunting. The men and the ch children do the chasing. They knock off the two deer that they're supposed to knock off. They carve it up. Everybody gets, that's a meat eater, gets some of the venison, goes in the freezer. They have a, a swally that night. Not many dead, if you see what I mean. They enjoy it. 
here, don't even start. Don't even start to try and describe the pantomime that happens here. And of course, that's a kind of controversial area because I'm not really for killing animals myself much. But when you begin to see how the Norwegians treat nature, they kind of forage it. I'm doing a PhD that's looking at cabins and huts. They have 490,000 second homes, of which 368,000 are huts. We have 400 huts. Um, we cannot experience nature, we can't experience ourselves, we can't experience the, the country that we live in because the land is already bought and sold. And the terrible thing is that we will, or perhaps it's already too late, have lost the urge. You know, why do you want to go to the country? Yeah, sure, I'm sure a few of you zip up hills and do Monroe bagging and so on. But at a larger level, you know, why go to a place where you're sort of on the back foot all the time? And then ask yourself about our country with its obesity problems, its drink problems, the problems that come from people containing everything within themselves physically instead of being able to find uh, release in nature, which we're designed to have. And you come back to a bigger question than money. That's a structural question about who owns this country and the danger that we will soon lose sight of the need to reclaim our right to have un a control of our natural assets. So, you know, egg, if you ever get the chance to go, do go, because it takes a little while for the penny to drop, but you suddenly realize this place feels a bit different <laughs> than the rest of Scotland. To me now, it feels quite Nordic. And that's the only place that to me does feel Nordic. Um, but that gives you a flavor of what it should be like everywhere. And there'll have to be some heavy lifting done to get this issue back up the agenda because, frankly, the uh, establishment doesn't care. And it relies upon the fact that most city-dwelling Scots don't care because so few. it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. The less anyone experiences nature, the less they value it, the less they notice they don't get it, the more it continues as it's done. So uh, that's a sort of rather gloomy note, which I can't think of a good way to brighten up, um, except that we have the most superlatively beautiful nature. And that's the other thing that traveling anywhere finally tells you. you know, the diversity in this country is utterly extraordinary. Um, what we have is utterly extraordinary. And the, the terrible shame of it in the end, that the contribution of so many Scots is only to drop litter on it, um, should be heartbreaking, and we should want to do something about it, um, and I hope you will. Thanks. Thanks for your talk, Leslie. That was very interesting. Um, would you have, do you think there are any, I mean, you talk about nature, so I suppose yeah, it throws me a bit that you talk about something like that rather than money, but are, are there any um, lessons for the wider population? Because the wider population does live in cities and um, you know, has the most effect on things like climate change, I guess. Well, it's principally about cities. I mean, you know, this is controversial, but we are the only country at our latitude where people don't have huts to escape to from cities at the weekend. Now, you know, the, Nor the Norwegians particularly are having a big argument about whether that's sustainable. But, but the, everyone has that habit, you know, from the Russians with their dachas through to all the different Nordics, the Germans, the Czechs, the Canadians, the Americans, the Icelanders, you know, anywhere that's had a wooded heritage, and admittedly we have cut a lot of ours down, has tended to develop a hutting culture. And it's kind of integral in people's behavior. You could have an argument about sustainability, but then an awful lot of people who go to the hut as their automatic destination every weekend are also not going on planes to wherever. You know, they, they expect to be fulfilled by what they find within roughly 37 kilometers of their first home. And that's the other thing. The pattern is not like many people have here, where they go to the ancestral home in the Western Isles and it takes like six hours to get there. The object of this is simply to have a different life, a manageable different life, not an idealized one that you can manage when it, you know, it's a huge problem for everybody, but something that's doable every weekend. 
and I think they just find it absolutely baffling. I mean, people who've been used to that pattern, you know, would rather have their legs broken than not be able to access their huts. And I wonder what it means that we don't even know what that's like. I mean, personally speaking, I do, because I eccentrically had a hut on top of a hill in Aberdeenshire for seven years. So this is about cities. And it's interesting that that's the way, you know, obviously egg is not a city. But um, the way things are heard is that nature is always about not cities. Whereas it's, this is principally directed in a way towards cities. Uh, just as another point, um, look at the big estates that seem to be so problematic in terms of deprivation. Nearly all of them are on quite elevated plains around cities. Easter House, Castle Milk, on thank that the scheme was about. They're all, you know, godless wind swept places. Wind swept, there's the point. You know, there's an asset, there are assets in that community, people who could run it, and there's an asset wind, right? So why not encourage people? to have small community-owned wind turbines in estates so they can have some income and then decide how to spend it. But no, no, you know, that's uh, not what anybody conceives of because we've got this big city-country kind of, you know, divide. Hi. Um, oh, we planted some seeds from egg, by the way, up at Bilston um, at the protest site, some of the natural bluebells up there. So hopefully they'll come up in two or three years, we see. But um, my point is, it's a very difficult question, I apologise. Um, but is the, the way the land is used by corporate entities, i.e. mining corporations, etc., such as Scottish coal, people like this, it's all very well saying, you know, we have this heritage, uh, of the land which we don't have access to, but at the same time it's being uh, systematically destroyed through open cast mining, quarrying, um, just getting rare elements. And this is not just an issue for Scotland, obviously, it's worldwide. Now, while the people do not have access to land for their own ends, i.e. growing food for their local communities to sustain themselves, while we are not having access to the land to do this, the corporate bodies do have access to the land to take away all and destroy for, for many future generations. Do you see uh, a way to stop this or um, any path where this can be um, kind of sidelined, slowed down, or do you think it's inevitable that the corporate world is going to eat the lion's share and leave us all scrabbling over the scraps? Well, uh, controversially, perhaps, <laughs> um, I don't see a problem with some industrial use of land. And uh, what I do see a problem with is who decides. So, for example, to go back to any of the Nordic models, um, they have very small municipalities, genuinely local government. Our local government is the largest in Europe. We have, on average, a council has 162,000 people in it. That's an average. The average in Sweden is 12,000. The average in Norway is about eight to 10,000. And they're more normal than we are. The more time you spend looking at the rest of Europe, you begin to understand that we are exceptional. We're weird. There is nobody runs their society like us. So for example, if you looked at, at something I wrote about recently, Barra, for example, another island, um, the Barra people wanted to knock back um, a marine conservation area around them. Now, you know, a lot of people will think marine conservation, that's good. You know, fucking make them do it because that's good for the environment. They were trying to argue that a lot of things they did, which they think are, are fairly conserving activities of fishing, and this is the Western Isles, this is not the big boys with the trawlers out of Peter Heed. Uh, they would like to be able to continue doing what they're doing, and they worry that the kind of blanket bans that have happened under other marine conservation areas that they can see would mean basically the Barra chaps would be out of a job. And to be blunt, they don't trust the Quangos. They've already you know, had triple SIs where they can't drag ditches without permission. You know, they've, they've been through this. So there's a question there as to, um, you can either decide from on high which outcome you want and enforce it. And to be honest with you, in that case, keep the land ownership as it is, because very few landowners want uh, quarries on their land. You know, it's the, land, the landowners do not want development in general. 
That's why our hydroelectric uh, development was 50 years behind Norway. It took a war before a Labour uh, Scottish secretary was able to enforce hydroelectric dams on land here because it constantly got vetoed. So the problem isn't, generally speaking, that the establishment is very keen to have industrial use of land. They want it for kind of pheasant shooting, rough characterization, you know, some will. So my, my thing is more, you know, who gets to decide? And my experience of small communities who learn to have some control over the, the na nature that's around them is that, you know, once you get very engaged in that, I think the best, you will probably come out with as good an outcome as it's gonna get. And that might sometimes be that you want to have some use, some industrial use of land where you think that's okay. And there'll be others where you absolutely will be the biggest opposers of any attempt to quarry. But who can say where that's right and who that, where that's wrong? At the moment, there's a very small bunch of people, developers and landowners, and then perhaps the government and maybe some council officials who get to sort of rubber stamp it or not, those are the guys that decide. And I'd rather they didn't. So I'm not trying to micromanage outcomes. I'm trying to say, as a general principle, we have not got the right decision-making structure right now. And we're sitting flanked by people. We're not flanked by people, because I wouldn't take, with all due respect, to our colleagues in the States. There's not many examples of their society I would like to import. We're sitting beside societies that regularly are coming top in any different league table you want to mention with tedious regularity. And we don't try to find out why it works. Well, they are public opinion. You see, when you say that, again, it's the model we have, people listening to public opinion. They are public opinion. I mean, I. I went, to, I went to a place in Iceland. There's a little municipality that runs everything in its town. There's only 800 people there, and they run everything. They part run the hospital with the other municipality beside them. So, you know, it isn't kind of like that's them. So you're saying it works? Works much better when it's by the people for the people, in, essentially. Small is beautiful. Yeah, right. If you want to get down to a community level, that's when people start to kick in but not community like community councils. Um, I was at a meeting of their last, the la they have an association of Scottish community councils. I was at their last meeting. Could you hazard a guess as to what the average budget of a community council is? The average annual budget of a community council, guess. Are you alive? Yes. Right, come on. 200,000? Nope. 500. You're close. It's 400 pounds. Yeah. Yep. That's the, that's the average budget, right? So, you know, after that, you don't need to have a, a more of a conversation about it. That is, you know, that is, if that's what we think of community, this is what you get. Community is not necessarily, you know, a legislated body or something like this. There are many communities that are self-administrating, self-organizing, self-sustaining, that have nothing to do with the political process as we understand it. Um, I mean, I'd like to harken back to, uh, because I feel like it got sidelined a little, um, the issue of the land being absolutely destroyed by corporate interests. Um, uh, and the local councils totally ignoring what the local populace want or need or say they don't want or don't need and the industry coming in anyway and taking it whether it's because of backhanders to council members or because of uh, you know a lobbying interest or whatever i don't know but it's uh, i mean it is a particular problem in scotland uh with scottish coal being exported everywhere basically and destroying vast tracts of very very useful land which people could cultivate live on you know this is what we don't have we don't have the land I appreciate that. I will end up just repeating, though, you know, what I've said. It's entirely up to who, who makes the decision. In other places, there are coal exports. In other places, there are iron exports, all sorts of timber exports. But the question is, who decides how big they are, what you get for it as a community, and whether it's worth it to despoil the place you live? Now, I'm quite happy to let small municipal-sized communities 
And I, un I do take your point about the difference between the sort of conventional political structure and the kind of wild men and women of Wonga out in Egg, because they have no status at all in the political firmament, and they're rocking. But what I'm trying to again make you think about is, why is this not this? In other, can you imagine a country where the rocking wild men and women of Wonga are the blinking municipality? Because they are. The fact we can't even conceive of it, the fact, you know, what we've got now is a vacuum. Nature abhors a vacuum. We've got these big, big so-called local authorities. Beneath it, there's nothing at the size of where you live. And, you know, other things, naturally, people organize. I'm in God knows how many different local things which have come into that vacuum. And that's good. That's probably the way Scotland will be because nobody will ever change the structure here. You know, we will never end up with those rocking people running the whole damn ship. I was crossing my fingers you there know, in the hope that I that would What I want is, I want people who are on. activists and practical to have a bigger canvas than the small canvas they currently have. But if you'd like them to stay that way, that's fine. And you will be in the majority, you will have, share that opinion with an establishment which is terrified of activists beginning to run the show of their entire lives. My ambition for communities is egg. You know, egg plus. Why the heck are people on egg even paying council tax now? They're rolling their own. Um, yeah, I don't know whether it's the right sort of question to ask, but two things. I've been quite inspired by Chris Cook and his Nordic model. I was wondering whether you could say anything about that and the other about uh, electricity, you know, and community ownership, whether you can say a bit more. And the other, have you heard of Shirley and Hardy's work on the law of the, um, the land uh, based on Henry George? and the whole movement. Henry George, the Georgists. Yeah, but her particular work, Birthright to Land, and the research she did also in the whole thing to do with water. And the, the, the recent book she wrote is called uh, Stolen Land, Stolen Lives. No? No, I haven't read it. Um, I do know Chris Cook. I don't understand his, uh, I don't understand the economic models that he is trying to put forward. I've got to say that. Um, to me, we're, we're so one step removed. You know, it's a bit like if you get the stage where there is a groundswell, then it, get, it gets the stage where you start to look at the, me the mechanics for delivering it. We're so far off that. I think myself, I think we need to get the stage where everyone in this room, <laughs> I don't know how many people are, well, I see Kevin Williamson, he's old enough to remember Network. Um, but, you know, that film where Peter Finch goes, gets everybody, this is the most bizarre thing here. Everybody to kind of go to the window, open it, shout, I'm Maricel and I'm not going to take it anymore. Like, you know, we're not there. So, okay, I understand. Um, there are horses for courses. There was a chap who came over to, from New Zealand. I remember this very distinctly in 1999. And he had set up the Alliance Party in New Zealand. And this party was composed of Maoris, farmers, and women. And I said to him, you know, major respect, I don't know how you keep that all going. You know, that's different people, isn't it? And he said, actually, those kind of groupings are not the issue. He said, and I've, I, not a week has passed that I haven't related this story since then because it's always so appropriate. He said, actually, within any group, there are stone throwers, institutional plodders, and alternative builders and they hate each other, and they need each other. Now, you know, Chris is probably not an institutional plotter. I'm not. So I can't, you know, I have no idea what it is he's on about, but all part is elbow. You know, what I'm trying to do is um, perhaps a bit of a kind of combination between a stone throw and an alternative builder, which is to try and say, visualize this damn country differently, please. Because until you do, you will not seek the mechanisms to change it. And I don't know that we're even there yet because of the difficulty people have with trying to imagine locally, practically activist people um, democratically running their lives. There's a lot of other things you said, but roughly that's that.
Um, I'm, I'm quite interested that you didn't mention, uh, you talked a lot about the problems of a society focused on money and materialistic considerations. Uh, and I'm quite interested that you didn't mention inequality um, in there, because obviously you look at a place like Norway, which has got far higher levels of um, equality, and uh, there's an obvious link between you know, materialistic um, societies and societies with high levels of inequality, because status becomes associated with wealth and people see attaining wealth as a means of attaining status and, and self-realization, things like that. Um, and surely if, if we want to achieve perhaps lo more localized decision-making, more transparent and participatory democracy, a less materialistic approach to the, the society around us, the first thing we should really be tackling is inequality in, in power, in income, in um, status in, in all these things. Sure. <laughs> I mean, you know, absolutely, absolutely. But but all I'm saying, oh, the re you know, look, there's three people speaking here. I'll shut up soon. I'll be out of your lives. I'm trying to divvy it up so I'm not hogging a whole blood of oxygen here, right? But um, it's a question of what you're trying to kind of put forward to people first, and uh, um, the inequality. I've spent my life on that one. Um, and it's very important. Uh, but I mean, like for example, um, the, the book, um, The Spirit Level, when it came out, I reviewed it for The Guardian. Wrote a piece in comment is free, never had such bile ever on the comments after it, never. I mean, I appreciate comment is free comment section is a day out for Daily Telegraph readers. I understand that now, you know? <laughs> and just like, as a word to everyone else, would you just go in there and put some normal comments sometime because it's kind of reassuring? But still, at the, the absolute bile that is reserved for anybody who kind of dares to think they could have an equal society is quite unbelievable. So you're quite right that this is absolutely strikes to the heart of everything in Britain. This deep-seated belief that if you're to become more equal, I am less. And that is the thing that has to be got. My own feeling about life um, is that I, I learn things more and I see things, uh, people really embracing ideas better when they are, in effect, physically involved in doing something different. And as an outcome of the different circumstance they find themselves in, they learn about equality. Now, I've had so many people wagging fingers at me in my life, I don't take it well. You know, isms, ologies, big old thoughts and stuff like that, fine. He's got a book, she's got a book, yeah, you know, that's terrific. I'm just speaking about me personally, nearly everything I've learned in life that's really gone boof, has been experienced. Now, I'm not saying everyone's the same, but I think we have a bit of a mismatch. We get a lot of dead brainy people with a lot of kind of didactic thoughts and we don't experience it at all. Uh, so my thing is, I'm always trying to kind of rectify any imbalance I find, and I'm not Libra. So my job is to try and keep saying all the time, experience, experience, experience. Get out there, do it, get out there, make mistakes, get out there, scare yourself, get out there, and love, get out there, learn, and then write a book. <laughs> <laughs>